go ahead. All right, great. Well, good afternoon to everybody who is joining us. Uh, welcome to the April Business Matters chat. Um, as we always do, we'll put questions at the end. So if you've got them, Anna will take them in the chat box or hold them to the end for yourself. Uh, we'll try to get as many, if not all, of the questions answered that you, you might have. Today, we're pleased to have Logan McCoy, Vice President of Services at CCB Technology. Logan directs the IT managed services and project teams at CCB, supporting managing clients locally and across the country. Uh, a part of the IT industry for 30 years, CCB works with the industry leading IT companies to provide solutions for small to mid-sized business and nonprofits. CCB was awarded both the MSP Elite 150 and the Security 100 by CRN, which recognizes the top security focused managed service providers in North America. Cybersecurity is a hot topic and uh, it's on the minds of most companies and, and individuals. And Logan's gonna touch on these areas and uh, give us some information uh, that we all need. So please join me with welcoming Logan McCoy. Logan, it's all yours. Great, thanks so much, Matt, appreciate that. I am going to share out my screen here. So maybe Matt, if you can, or Anna, just let me know. Do you guys see what I'm sharing out right now? Yep, all good. Great, got some thumbs up there. Fantastic, great. So uh, I've entitled this Securing Your Organization, and this is really meant to piggyback on what Anna had sent out probably two or three months ago around some information that came out from CISA in regards to some things that are really good for us all as part of varying organizations of different sizes to be aware of and how we can better secure our environment from potential threats and threat actors. And so I'm really going to be looking at a couple of key ways that you can hopefully start to take some good steps to help you do that. Um, as I jump into this here, Matt did a great job of giving a quick intro on myself and CCB. So I'm going to move past both of those slides there and jump right into what we're talking about today, which is why securing your organization matters. And the, I like to start with this one, and I like to actually even just start with a couple of data points, because I think that we all kind of know in theory um, why it matters. But for me, data points and statistics really help actually hammer home why this is so relevant for us today. So one of the first ones that I always like to point out is that in 2020, 85% of organizations were hit by some type of phishing attack. And if you don't know what a phishing attack is, basically, if you've ever seen an email come across and it's come from the CEO of your organization or the CFO or somebody from the outside, maybe if you're you know, outsourcing your HR type of a thing and maybe it's from ADP and it's coming through, for example, and it's not actually from that person or from that organization, but it's an attempt to either gain access to your environment, your own credentials, Maybe it's got a payload like ransomware or something like that. That's what a phishing attack is. But in 2020, again, 85% of organizations were hit by some type of attack in this, in this way, shape, or form, which is an incredibly high percentage. Um, even us here at CCB, we have to be constantly vigilant for this because as an MSP, we're very constantly targeted because we actually maintain and secure you know, organizations, infrastructures all across the nation. And so because of that, we're a prime target because we have the domain admin credentials. We have basically the keys to the kingdom. So if they can get access to our environment, they can get access to potentially hundreds of clients' environments, right? And so for us, we see a lot of these every single day. Um, but for most organizations, the majority of them, or like what we see here, 85% see that. And the reality is that's a statistic from 2020. I would be fairly confident to say that that number is probably higher if it were recorded in 2021 or 2022. But what this all equates to from a business perspective is that on average, back in 2020, the average ransom fee that was paid was $200,000. Now I know from an SMB perspective, because I was able to get the list from Anna about most of the people that were attending. And I think that for the majority of us on here, we would kind of fall into that SMB range, right? Small to medium sized business. Even if not, even if it's on the enterprise side, a $200,000 loss, just straight up loss, would be an incredible hit to any organization, right? And so when you think about why it matters for securing your organization, you have to really come back to think of why do I have insurance policies, right? Why do I have health insurance policies of, of that kind of nature? It's because if something happens, I wanna make sure that I'm covered, right? 
And in securing your organization, that's in many ways what you're trying to do. You're trying to mitigate as much as possible that exposure, and you're trying to eliminate as much as possible, if there is an exposure, the damage that that does to your organization, which again, just harkens back to the fact of why it matters. And for many of us, we probably have our own personal stories, right? That go beyond statistics or what we see in the media of some of these really large breaches that occur. We've, we've probably experienced that ourselves, either on a personal level or even within our own organizations, right? And so as we look at a couple different ways of how we can secure our organization, the first thing that I, I like to say and that I want to start off with is that what I have here as a list is not exhaustive in any way, shape, or form. There are a ton of things that you can and really should be looking to do as you're looking to continually improve the overall security posture of your organization. But the ones that I'm really going to be listing here today, I would say are ones that if you're not looking at, you probably are putting yourself at a greater risk than, than you really need to be. And so again, this isn't an exhaustive list, but it's a pretty important list with what we have here. The first one is multi-factor authentication. Um, if you've ever had a banking app or any type of application, most of what I'd say we do from a banking or financial perspective or anything that contains any type of sensitive data, a lot of times now those uh, software companies or vendors are requiring you to have. So for example, I, uh, I bank at Johnson Bank or some people bank at Chase, and they'll have multiple ways in which you have to authenticate who you are. And so multi-factor authentication is essentially doing that same thing. So if you've ever had a push notification come to your cell phone after you've logged in that says, hey, we just got this attempt to log in. Was that you? Approve, yes or no type of a thing. Sometimes you might have via text message, you know, a, a six-digit code sent to you that you have to plug in when you're logging in. Basically what that is, is it's just a, another layer for you to be able to assure and authenticate that it's actually you logging in and it's not somebody else who's trying to attempt to log into your environment, right? And bar none, this is one of the best ways for you to protect your organization. Because the reality is you can train your users, and we're going to talk about that in a moment here, but you can train your users, you can do a number of different things, but one of the best ways that you can secure your user's environment and their credentials and essentially your company credentials is by not putting all of your eggs just in the basket of making sure that the password meets a certain type of complexity. Um, because oftentimes what we see when breaches occur, it's not because somebody did a brute force attack where they were just guessing password after password and finally got it because it was an easy password of ABC123. It was because of a phishing attack where someone was lured into thinking, oh, I need to reset my password. It's that time of the year. And they plug in their credentials into a website that looked authentic and looked real, like for Microsoft 365. And now as complex as that password was, it's exposed. So that person who's now gained access to that can jump right in. And if you don't have MFA enabled, can log right in and potentially based on what credentials and permissions that user has, do a fair amount of damage, right? And the thing about, thing, thing about multi-factor authentication is that the reason why I always put this as the number one is that most of the applications and software that you're using probably already includes this in some way, shape, or form. So while there at times can be like an implementation cost, if you use an organization like CCB or something of that nature, most of the time, unless you're wanting to try and standardize this so that you only have one authentication app across all the applications you're using, or unless you're wanting to try and do certain things like conditional access, so this is only being prompted under certain conditions, unless you start getting into those types of things, you're many times already paying for this. And so it's kind of that thing of when you, you know, when you buy something, you want to make sure you're using it fully. Well, oftentimes with the applications you're using, and Microsoft 365 is a really good example, if you as an organization are using that, you already have MFA as, as a solution set that you just need to enable. Again, there's certain things that might require you to pay more, but right out of the box, you simply could just enable it, train your users, and you're off to the races type of a thing. The other reason why I often recommend this, not just because of what came out with CISA, not just because oftentimes it's already baked into what you're already paying for, um, but is because a lot of organizations, especially over the last year or so, were really starting to get pushback from their cybersecurity insurance providers. If you use Travelers or Hanover or whoever it might be, you might have gotten uh, some type of security questionnaire or something related to hey, we're only going to insure you if you have MFA enabled and if you have MFA enabled on X, Y, and Z. 
And so it's not just uh, something that I would say is good to have, but in many cases, we've had organizations who they have renewed their cybersecurity insurance policy and they haven't had MFA enabled. And it very clearly states, if you don't have this enabled, we're not covering you. And so in that case, they're basically paying for something that should they incur a breach, they're not going to get any type of coverage for, right? That claim's not going to be honored. And so it's also from that side, a major um, dynamic that now needs to be taken into account and why for me, multi-factor authentication is one of those first steps that if I don't see an organization using it across the board, I would highly, highly recommend. And it's why it's the very first thing that if you go back to what was sent out by, by Ray Mac all those months ago, it's the very first thing that they list there of enabling MFA. So first one right away is multi-factor authentication. The second one is around fish simulation awareness and training. And this can come from, you've maybe heard of vendors like Know Before or Barracuda. And basically what this relates to is being able to set up some type of cadence. It can be on a monthly basis, a quarterly basis, whatever it might be, where you're able to send out phishing type emails to your organization to test and see how fish prone they are, how prone they are to actually click on the link, right? And what this gives you is a really good idea of as an organization as a whole, who is most prone to click on those and in them being most prone, what are they most, most prone to click on? You'd be so surprised to find out that oftentimes it's not even business related. I've, we do this for our own organization and we've had users that have clicked on Amazon and random Google emails that have nothing to do with our business, interestingly enough. But we also have the ones around Microsoft 365 because we use that around solutions like ConnectWise because that's a software that we use. And so you're able to tailor it in a way that it's relevant to your organization and to the applications and into what their business processes and functions are every single day. And you're able to really see how good are they at spotting of an actual fish, right? Based on the email address, based on the link that's pushed in there, based on how it's worded and the grammar and the sense of urgency. And if it's coming from someone like a CEO, like they never write a message like this. They would never ask for $5,000 in X, Y, and Z. And so enabling them and training them, which again, in that sense, what it creates is that awareness. Because what you really want to do in that case there is train your users to be able to be aware. Because so often it's that lack of awareness or that just moving too quickly and not thinking twice before you click that exposes the organization. Because so often now for our tests, when we run them, our, most of our users, if they click on it, they say, it wasn't because I didn't realize it. It's because I was moving so fast and I clicked on it before I was able to stop myself or, or just double check it. And so again, it's, it's a great thing in creating that awareness. And it's a great thing as well, because it's not just testing them in that simulation, but then it's also giving them training and enabling them to figure out, okay, how, if I, if I'm not good at spotting these types of emails, how do I improve? And that training's a part of these types of packages. So it runs them through a 15, 30 minute or an hour long, kind of whatever you base it and what you want it to be type training to help them spot those types of, of phishing attacks and what they look like so that when they see them in the real world, when they see them in the wild, they're able to spot them and kind of move on from them, right? And the reason why this one is so important, and it's, I put this one here actually, and it's not, I would say very clearly spelled out in that document, but the reason why I put it in here is because the number one target for threat actors are your end users. They just are. It more than going through your firewall, more than trying to get past an EDR type solution, anything like that, they know that the easiest way to get into your organization's environment is through your users. And one of the easiest ways to do that is through an email. Because oftentimes, and there's a, been a ton that's happened from a technology advancement, but it's easy for those to get through, for those to, to be and look fairly realistic and fairly real world. And, and that the success rate for those is extremely high in the sense of a threat actor getting you to click on it. And so again, training your users to be aware of this because they are the biggest target is by far and away one of the best things that you can do in helping to improve your overall security posture as an organization. The next one relates to really looking to secure your endpoint devices. Um, obviously, we're a few years now into uh, the pandemic and into COVID, and we all know that one of the biggest things that that, that whole thing did was shift work to now be much more remote-based and remote-focused. And 
that in many ways has had, I think, been really great um, for a number of things. But one of the biggest challenges from an IT perspective is now that all of these endpoints are residing outside of the organization and at home offices, how can you secure those and secure those just as effectively as when they were behind the company's firewall, or behind the company's network? How are you making sure that updates and things of that nature are being pushed um, proactively and effectively, right? And that in not just those being pushed, but how is that device being protected, right? So another big solution that I often recommend, and it's listed within this document as well in a number of different places, but is, is implementing an endpoint detection and response solution, which is essentially just the evolution of antivirus. So if you've heard of the word antivirus and you know that at all, it's basically the evolution of that. And the reason why I'm, I'm wording it as the evolution of it is because traditional AV, as, as it's been for the last 20 or so years, is becoming more and more ineffective in being able to protect an endpoint device or a user from spotting an attack. And, and one of the biggest reasons for that is because traditional AV uses essentially, we'll just call them these massive databases all around the world to try and take in all of these malicious files or types of malicious uh, threats that are coming in. And basically what it's doing is it's taking and ingesting all of that information. And so when it has all of that and it's trying to run that as a check against what's on your machine to see if it matches up to say, okay, I have this malicious A file that's you know in the wild that I've got in my background database. As, does it actually match what's on this device right now? The problem with that is, is that while it's effective if, if it can catch it and match it, the proliferation of the amount of different types of malicious code and things of that nature that are being created every single day, those databases can't keep up. And so what, you've, what we've had to develop to better protect the endpoints is to move beyond a solution that uses it kind of just as a file-based and move it more to something that is either like a zero trust or in many cases, an AI, an artificial intelligence-based approach. So like one solution we often recommend is a solution by Sentinel-1. It's an EDR type solution and it uses an AI behavioral type approach. So an example I can give to you for that is, um, Everybody knows that Microsoft Word should not just automatically start up by itself. That, that's not a normal behavior of Microsoft Word. And so if on someone's machine, Microsoft Word was just constantly starting up every, you know, just self-start up every single time, Sentinel One would look at that behavior, because again, it's an AI behavioral approach and say, that's not the normal behavior of Microsoft Word. And it would either look to quarantine that, to block that. It, it could do a number of different things based on how you have that configured so that it would mitigate that type of response. Now, the thing is, or that type of threat, in, in that case there, it might not be, any, be something that any database is aware of at that point in time. It could be completely brand new or just hasn't been put in yet to where, again, a traditional AV might not spot that because it's not in the database yet. But in this case here, it doesn't need to be in the database because instead what it's doing is taking that approach and saying, this just isn't normal behavior. And in addition to that, because it's based on the behavior, it's looking beyond just a file-based level, and it's looking at the entirety of the actual system, which anytime you're able to look at something more comprehensively, you're going to get a better outcome from that, right? And so not just uh, does a solution like that provide better security, but another big thing that that document often spoke to was being able to improve your logging and your reporting so that you can have a more effective response. And that is really where an EDR solution shines. Because oftentimes what was happening with these types of security solutions that sat on your endpoints were they, they were getting better from a protection side, but then they were spitting out all of this data. And when an incident occurred, there was so much data it was incredibly hard to actually parse through it all and to figure out, okay, what's relevant and what do I need to focus on? Because I have pages and pages and pages of data and I don't know where to start because of all of this data. And so one of the big things that an EDR solution does as well, not only does it provide that, I would say more uh, secure level of protection, a more effective level of protection, it also parses through all of that reporting. It does the logging and the reporting and it synthesizes it down so that if there is an incident, your ability to respond and remediate it is going to be much faster than in previous because it's already done a lot of that front end legwork for you, which again, so much of what that document spoke to was having a plan in place to respond because the question isn't so much if, but when. It's not if this is gonna happen, it's when this does happen, how are you going to respond? What do you have in place to kind of help within that? 
The next one that I often like to talk about, and this is just as old as time really, is good, just good old patch management. And again, this thing was, I would say, um, it became more apparent of the issue that this was as more and more users began to move into a remote type work environment. Because what was so often pushed via the domain or the network was no longer able to be pushed because users weren't joining the VPN as much. They weren't on the domain as much because they weren't in the environment. And because of that, some devices, whether it was software-based, whether it was an, an operating system-based type update, wasn't getting pushed, which left massive security vulnerabilities for those devices, right? And so another key thing to think about is if you haven't already implemented a patch management type solution, not just for Windows operating systems or for Microsoft Office, but even third-party applications. So things like Adobe or unique applications that you might be using, making sure that you have an effective patch management strategy and solution baked out. It's just kind of one of those good foundational things. It's, it's I played basketball growing up all, all through high school and everything. And, and it was just that thing of you could tell people who had good foundations of, of what they could then build upon, right? Patch management is really similar to that. If you have a really good foundational patch management strategy, you are already mitigating a lot of the issues out there because if there is one way that threat actors are trying to get into your environment apart from trying to get through it via a user, it's through um, a device that hasn't been patched and is still exposed to a vulnerability that was identified, right? And so cre again, creating that effective patch management strategy and solution is absolutely critical. The last thing that I, I like to point out, because again, and I mentioned it just a moment ago, is for many of us, the issue of an incident where it's a security related incident occurring is not as much an if as a when. And when that happens, having a, a plan in place, and oftentimes as an overarching statement, we would call this a business continuity type plan. And this would extend even beyond if there's a security breach. This would extend to, let's say that there's a that there is some type of natural event or disaster that means the entire building is out of commission. Maybe it's not a tornado or a hurricane, but maybe power is lost and it's not going to be restored for three or four days because a, a significant storm did come through. The building's still there, but there's no power to it. So you can't get to anything. You can't turn anything on, right? So even in those types of situations, having a business continuity plan so that you know how to respond quickly in the event of something like this happening. And one of the best ways that you can start with all of that, guys, is by having a good backup and DR plan. And that, that plan is really going to vary based on your needs. But that's the thing is you have to identify what your needs are. What is critical for you to not just have backed up, but to have a DR plan around that in the event the organization goes down and, and you can't access those files locally at the headquarters or at the main location, but you still need to access those files. You still need to work within that system. You still need to access that application. What does that look like? How do you spin that up? How are users going to access that? These are great questions to ask and then to develop a plan around so that in the event it does happen, you're not having to react, but you're able to immediately jump into a proactive plan because you've already put in that effort to build it out. But it really, in many ways, does start with a good, solid backup solution. And the thing is, and I, I've, I've talked about this in other webinars that I've done, most organizations, if you ask them, will say they have a backup solution. That, I think that number, that percentage is typically in like the 80 to 90%. If you ask those same organizations, how many of them test that? on a consistent basis to ensure that their backups are actually working, it drops to like 30%. So you're basically putting an, an backup, I, the biggest thing people think at times is that backup is like the set it and forget it type solution. I set it, I forget it, I don't have to worry about it. And it couldn't be anything further from the truth. We deal with backups every single day and we can just tell you it's a nature of the business that backup jobs, so to run a backup, they fail. And you need to look into why they fail. Because chances are, if you don't remediate why that one backup job failed, all the ones after it are going to fail as well. And I can't tell you how many times we've come into organizations where we're not managing their environment, but they've, they've gone down, their main server's gone down, they're trying to restore from their backups, which they thought they had in place, and they haven't had a successful backup in three months. And so they can restore their data from three months ago. Three months of data is lost. And that's just the thing of, so many organizations, they put it in place, they make that initial investment, but they don't do the maintenance required to make sure that it's continuing to function as needed. They don't do that testing to see, all right, so we've got backups, they're successful because we see the backup jobs and we're getting the you know green thumbs up, that's great. 
But how long is it actually going to take for us to restore? If we had to restore a whole server, our whole file server, our whole DB, if we just have to restore these applications, how long is that going to take? To give you an idea of if you're down, how long you're down for type of a thing. So one thing that we always say at the, you know, at the very end is we're looking at these, which again, none of these are meant to say this is the end all be all silver bullet, but is to have that proactive plan in place because so much of it, again, is not a matter of if, but a matter of when. Great, I think, yep, that's everything that I had on my end, Anna and Matt. So I think we, we wanted to open it up as a time for, for Q&A with everything. Yeah, that would be great. Anna, did you, did you get anything in the chat box? You're on mute, Anna, can't hear you. <laughs> yeah. I was saying you can stop sharing the screen just if people want to look at each other, that'd be great. Thank you. Yep. Um, what? Uh, talking about this recovery, disaster recovery plan, if you have an IT um, provider, can they help you with that? I mean, how do you start from a uh, with a blank piece of paper? I mean, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Any advice on that? Yeah. So, I mean, this is something that we do for a lot of the organizations that we support, and it's either as kind of like a one-off um, you, you could say like a consulting type engagement or implementation, or it's that ongoing. But I mean, the, the best place to start, Anna, really is to look at, you know, from the best way I would start to look at it from a business perspective is to say, if we went down and we weren't able to function, how much would we be losing in revenue on a daily basis? And the reason why I start with that is because it's really good to know what your loss in revenue would be so that as you're building out a solution, you can build it out in accordance with, well, it's good to have this solution in place because if we didn't, oops, sorry, if I don't move, my, <laughs> my lights go off. Um, if we didn't have this solution in place, then this is what we would be losing every single day. And from a, a business owner, you know, that kind of financial perspective, it, it puts justification behind the why again in that, which is why it matters. But in really kind of looking at um, where to start, what I then would really start to, to look at and dive into are, what are the key applications and what are the key files? What are the key servers that we have to have backed up? And in looking to have them backed up, you kind of want to help start to then build out that strategy of what do we need to have that, that needs to be maintained locally and what do we need to push to the cloud? Meaning that you know, we might have some archival data that if it does eventually, if, if we were to lose it, it's not the end of the world, but we do want to maintain it just in case if we need it for something down the road versus we need to maintain some of this data because we need to maintain HIPAA compliance. And if we don't do that and we lose this data and then we get audited, that's, I think it's like 250 bucks for every single piece of PI information. So, um, so it's stuff like that um, where you can start to look at those overarching type scenarios and questions as an organization as a whole. And then to bring in, I mean, it, it really would be either the internal IT director, IT manager, or an organization like CCB coming in to say, now that you've, we've helped identify what are those critical business applications, files, so on and so forth, how do we now start to build out what that solution looks like to get you to a good backup and DR solution, and then as well, just overall the ability to restore quickly, so. Okay, still, st still, yeah. Sounds stressful to me, but it's on a list now of things now I think I need to do anyway. <laughs> so uh, my other question, how often uh, would you advise doing training or those little fishing tests? Mm. I mean, training really up to up to any organization? On yeah, it is. We, we really see clients do uh, they kind of do it all across the board. I would say the majority of clients do it on like a, a quarterly basis. And that's typically how we do it as well now as well as we do it more so on a quarterly basis, uh, simply because um, monthly at times seems to be uh, too much and not as effective. Um, and that quarterly basis just seems to be um, that kind of right amount of cadence. So I would say most, most organizations that we see do it, they do it on a quarterly basis. All right. And I was doing a little research about cybersecurity insurance. Uh, it, mm. it 
the research I saw, the article I read, not like it said 27% of companies like actually have it. Any, I mean, again, not that you're an insurance agent, but just would the advice be just ask your broker, contact your insurance company if you do not have cybersecurity insurance? Everybody should, I'm assuming. Yeah, it's definitely one that you, I mean, you always have to weigh those costs, but yes, I would highly recommend it because again, and I know I'm kind of beating that dead horse, but it's not an, a matter of if, but that when. So um, having some type of cybersecurity insurance, and that's where a good a good broker will kind of be able to help you get to a, a good fit of what that policy should be and what that should extend like. Because for us, with obviously what we're doing, we've we've got a pretty big plan just simply because we're not just providing that security for our own organization, but for other organizations as well. So we, we're different, right? Um, it's the same thing if you have to adhere to some type of compliance or you have different regulations, that might put more weight on to actually making a s substantial investment into some type of policy like that. But I would, I would say definitely contact your broker if, if you don't have an insurance policy to at least have that discussion of what that would look like. I'm going to jump in there since I'm married to the insurance guy, but um, he seriously does have a client who is our RAMAC member who recently, I mean, he does not have cybersecurity insurance and he sure wishes he did because he handles other people's monies and someone actually scammed them for $40,000. And so now they're out the $40,000 where if they would have had the cybersecurity insurance, which he insists that they take, but they don't always take it. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, nobody thinks it's going to happen to them until it happens to them. And then they go, shoot, I wish I would have had that. So that's yep. my two cents. Look at that. Plug, plug for data insurance. <laughs> it's easy. Um, Matt, I don't know if you had a, any questions specifically you wanted to ask. I don't have any other questions in the chat that came directly to me. No, you kind of covered it. I, just uh, some ways that the bad actors get in. And, and uh, I think you covered that early on. So that was the one question that uh, that I had for you. Um, anybody else out there have a question that you want to unmute yourself and throw at Logan before we let him go? I guess everybody's got it figured out. So. <laughs> it's, it can be overwhelming. We've learned a lot here at, at RAMAC in the past three to six months. So it actually is starting to make a little bit of sense the more and more you kind of educate yourself. So we really appreciate that, <laughs> Logan. You're, uh, the only thing I do have a piece of advice is the acronyms in IT world need to just kind of slow down a little bit. That's my only, my only gripe. <laughs> yes. Oh, trust me. I'm, I'm with you, Anna. I, <laughs> yeah. If I wasn't in it every day, um, yeah. I understand that. I'm always trying to be aware of it too, but I'm sure I probably went like I was talking a different language there for a little bit. So yeah, sorry if I did that. Okay. 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 It was okay. It was okay. So I just want everyone uh, else that's on the call to know that we started a little tech tip in our monthly member to member e-news blast that we send out um, just because this is a constant constant conversation, cybersecurity, all the things, examples like Carmela just brought up, it really does happen. So we've only done that for about two months. We just started it. So there's a little tech tips in there that we thought would be just a nice addition to one of our newsletter. Um, e-blasts. So thank you, Logan, as well for for that information that you all are sending us. You bet. Great. All right. Um, thank you to everybody. Wait, did we get a last minute question here? Oh, it just says oh, very informative. Very <laughs> Wisconsin informative. Society so, says okay. thank you. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Bethany. Our, our last uh, business matters chat for the spring is going to be Wednesday, May 25th. We are working uh, on trying to get somebody from the county health department to uh, come talk with us. And then, of course, we take the summer off and we'd be back in September. So look for the announcement on who our speaker will be on May 25th. And uh, I hope to see many of you, if not all of you, at the dinner tomorrow night. 
Um, and if not, be safe. And thanks for attending today. Logan, thank hey. you. Thank you. Thanks again, Logan. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye now.